Good afternoon, everybody. It's an honor to be here. Um, thank you very much for the time. I feel very honored and privileged to be part of this Thought Leadership Conference. Um, today, we're going to have a panel and to talk about the science and medicine aspects of cannabis. And uh, in so many ways, uh, my experience over the last decade in testing cannabis has really began to inform um, the properties that, oh, <laughs> sorry, has really began to inform how much uh, testing in such a way is this language of meaning to help really understand a higher level about this plant and uh, the true potential of the full plant phytotherapeutic outcomes to individualize patient care. And then also beyond that to understand the bioaccumulation properties that this plant has and uh, telling the story about a lot of the legacy of where the plant's grown, you know, all the different supply chain potential contamination points uh, that can come about. And uh, through this panel of uh, some very esteemed guests, um, we will be exploring many of these topics. And so panelists can come out. Um, we have Addie Poe, sorry, Edie, sorry, Edie Ray, Dr. Edie Ray, Dr. Sue Sisley, Jeremy Plume, and Jeremy Sackett of Cascadia Labs. All right, and uh, we're going to start the panel today with uh, some brief introductions so you can know a little bit about more, more about our panelists. Go ahead, Edie. Hi, my name is Dr. Edie Ray. I publish under the surname Wilson Poe. I am an academic neuroscientist. I've been studying the interaction between cannabis and opioids my entire career. Um, I wear several hats. Um, one of them is academic, where I really focus on translational and preclinical evidence to support the use of these two therapeutic drugs together um, and to reduce our reliance on opioids. Um, but I also do some human work, some clinical work, which is both inside and outside of the academic institutions. Hi, I'm Sue Sisley. I'm an internal medicine doctor from Scottsdale, Arizona. This is Dodger. He's our facility dog at the laboratory. We work at Scottsdale Research Institute where we conduct FDA-approved controlled trials looking at smoked and vaporized cannabis flower as medicines. We're trying to put flower bud through the entire FDA drug development process. And we're, you may know about our lawsuit against the DEA and the Attorney General to try to open up the, the federally legal drug supply for clinical trials. Someday I'm hoping to be able to buy flour from Flocana, so <laughs> see what happens. <laughs> my name's Jeremy Plum. It's a great pleasure to be back in my old home, which is Sonoma County. It feels like pilgrimage. Um, I am actually from Portland, Oregon now. I've been there the last 20 years. I helped to found an evidence-based dispensary called Pharma which really worked to curate chemovars and was very patient-focused. I've also co-founded an event called the Cultivation Classic, our largest uh, organic crafts-focused cannabis event in Oregon. Um, I also am working currently as director of production science at a facility that's probably the most high-tech facility in the country in terms of creating controlled environment precision ag models so that we can understand a bit more about what's going on with this phenotypic plasticity of this amazing plant that we're all serving and understand the relationships between changes in terroir and the production environments and genotypes and the kinds of chemistry and pharmacology the plant produces. I'm a huge fan of whole plant medicine and here to build bridges around how we can increasingly be good for great things and serving this ancient force. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> My, my name is Jeremy Sackett. Uh, my education was in pharmacy and clinical pharmacy practice. Uh, very short amount of time spent in that uh, professional space and quickly shifted over to a research and development in pharmaceutical sciences um, for many reasons. Uh, didn't really see the big pharma model as the place to apply my um, passion uh, and, and being, uh, having a relationship with uh, the cannabis plant throughout my adult life. In 2013, founded an analytical testing laboratory, Cascadia Labs in Oregon. Uh, we are uh, the tenant here and uh, at Flow uh, Cannabis Institute. Uh, so 
with the uh, foundation of analytical testing, as, as, as I see it, is really to ensure that that product is free of contaminants, but also looking at those active ingredients, the cannabinoids and terpenes, better understanding what those profiles are, so then we can move towards, uh, you know, uh, human trials and, 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 and other, you know, um, using that data to better understand the plant and how it, the experiences that come out of that whole plant uh, Awesome, awesome, and you know, and so in, um, in so many ways now, uh, kind of with California taking as much of a, you know, leadership direction in regulating cannabis with really high integrity around public health and safety, you know, kind of analytical testing is now beginning to show a lot of really interesting trends, kind of, and you know, in their lives, I think a lot of, you know, competitive advantage that small farms, craft farms have, and so Jeremy, if you would mind, kind of maybe get into a little bit of, uh, you know, the vulnerabilities I think that 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 uh, you know testing labs help to expose, but also kind of, um, you know, bring out kind of through testing and, you know, just some of these different, you know, trends in agriculture. Right. Yeah. And, and definitely from that contaminant basis, right, as, as a whole plant, as a, a natural plant product, uh, cannabis is, is not toxic. There's no toxicity studies that I'm aware of uh, where uh, consumption of cannabis really produces uh, a toxicity or an intoxicated inf effect. It's really, you know, potentially, uh, you know, an undesirable effect if it's an overdose of THC or certain terpenes that you, you know, come on some, you know, non-ideal uh, paranoia, anxiety that many non-cannabis users or, 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 or cannabis uh, new users may experience without the right uh, starting point of that plant uh, consumption. But, you know, looking at those contaminants and controlling those is hyper important uh, as the industry commercializes. And really, as you move beyond the plant product, Products. I'm sure most folks are aware of the vape issues that you know have been uh, hitting the media recently and, and further into formulated products really understanding what those formulations are you know and how they may impact you know what is delivered to the body based on either that that process or how it is consumed is, is very important as I see it from a testing perspective absolutely and I'm glad you bring up the uh, the whole vape issue you know I think uh, this is a major moment you know it's a very auspicious kind of timing with the, all this vape related issues and you know deaths and it's, I think it's a really important time we as a community especially elders in the community that have been in service to this plant for so long to uh, really define and show what we've done and the level of quality that we've been able to achieve, you know, kind of, you know, most tightly regulated, you know, supply chain now in, you know, that's ever been regulated. You know, a lot of people say now cannabis is cleaner than a lot of the tap water in the United States and cleaner than the food system. And so kind of, I think there's, you know, a lot that we can do to show that, you know, what this is, you know, is, is, is the product of untested, unregulated industries from tobacco, you know, the distillation of the tobacco crop for the e-juice, you know, the, all these other potential contaminants from heavy metals and, you know, and also the illicit kind of uh, supply chain where a lot of the really dirty extracts where the pesticides and contaminants super concentrate, you know, all, you know, get cut and diluted with different cutting agents and, um, you know, kind of basically it's, it's uh, no regard to public health or safety and a lot of that goes to the East Coast of the United States, but kind of shifting a little bit and getting into you know, a lot of the potential for cannabis science to really help getting, get into knowing the plant more for the potential for medical outcome and therapeutic use. Um, Edie, would you please? Uh, yeah, well, I, I, I really like what you said about, you know, really quantifying all of the ingredients, whether those are pathological ingredients or potentially useful ingredients. Mm -hmm. You know, knowing what is in our cannabis is a huge step forward from anything that we've seen in the last 5,000 years of the cultivation of this plant. So having that knowledge base to build from is incredibly useful, both from a public safety standpoint, you know, understanding that you know, people can't be inhaling either toxins that were applied before the plant was harvested or after it's been formulated in, in the case of these cartridges. Um, but beyond safety, there's also the question of efficacy or, you know, how well does it work? And efficacy is relative. You know, we have medical efficacy. How well does a medicine relieve a headache or how well does a, a medicine fight cancerous cells? Um, but we also talk about, you know, broader efficacy in terms of supporting um, whatever kind of health or wellness paradigm um, is suitable to a particular individual. Um, and so we know now that we can quantify, you know, what these ingredients are that are in these flowers that people are consuming, 
we can measure people's responses to those ingredients. And we see that, you know, at, at least in our hands, that people tend to prefer flours that are lower than 20% THC, which somewhat goes against how things are playing out in the market because there's this constant drive toward potency and um, really being, you know, proud of those flours when, you know, actually, you know, 20% is still pretty good, and even 14% is really good. Mm -hmm. People really enjoy those flowers if they have a chance to consume them blinded. You know, that is, they don't know what the product is they're consuming. Um, and so, you know, if, if I think about efficacy, you know, the kinds of things that people find the most beneficial, um, knowing the ingredients is a critical component, but then really truly measuring people's responses to those um, ingredients um, is the next level of information. And Sue definitely has more experience than anyone about measuring those kinds of effects in, in people. Yeah, yeah and, uh, and getting into kind of the work Sue does, you know, I pay a lot of respect and tribute. You know, I'm a veteran of the Navy. I work a lot with veterans of post-traumatic stress, and it's one of the biggest passions I have. And, you know, paying tribute and respect to the work Sue's done and really challenging these federal, you know, uh, monopolies and kind of tight-gripped El Soli kind of bammer herb, basically, kind of to help really get more into the complexity of what cannabis can do and the potential for post-traumatic stress. And so if you could please yeah, indulge Absolutely, us. Alan. Thank you. I really am grateful to the whole veteran community who stood by us as we've been trying to kick down the doors of the government that's been systematically impeding cannabis clinical trials for years. Not safety studies, right? Safety studies looking at harmful effects of cannabis, or addiction potential of cannabis, those studies fly through the regulatory process, get all the government money they want, all the government weed they want. But if you dare say you want to study efficacy of cannabis, how effective is cannabis at treating a certain illness, what cultivars are best for what illnesses, those are the studies that have been blocked for over 50 years. And um, it, with the veteran study that Alec is, is re referencing, was uh, an FDA phase two trial that we just completed. It took us 10 years to get that study across the finish line. Um, the, the results are, are unbelievably disappointing. Um, and that is, a, I believe, a direct result of the quality of the cannabis that we are forced to purchase from the federal government. You know, the, the government enforced monopoly at the University of Mississippi has existed since 1968. And I was hoping to show you some pictures of the quality of this cannabis, but many of you have seen, we've posted the photos of our study drug online on our website, sriresearch.org. You can see the array of shots of this green powder that's moldy and diluted with stems, sticks, seeds, leaves. Uh, and it's, you know, just a, a, such a stark contrast to what we just saw this morning. Mm -hmm. The quality of this flower is something I dream of using in a clinical trial, but we will not be able to ever do that until we win this litigation. So it's really important for all of us to get behind this lawsuit. We were real, super fortunate to get a group of pro bono attorneys to take this case. They have extensive federal litigation experience. And your own governor here in California will not support this lawsuit. We've asked him for months now to, to submit an amicus brief to help move this forward. And Newsom has not responded. And I think that's uh, an atrocity because you're growing the best flower in the world here, and the fact that he's not pushing for these, you know, these chemovarts to be used in clinical trials is just astonishing to me. So if any of you know him and can reach out to him, we really need him to get behind this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sue. And, uh, and so kind of from there, kind of, you know, love to engage Jeremy, you know, and really being able to articulate, I think, some of the you know, the, the chemometric complexity that this plant has and to really understand how to kind of work with this plant um, therapeutically and, you know, individualized patient care of our individualized endocannabinoid systems, you know, I think paying tribute to the diversity of what the plant has and through data and science being able to, you know, really, are you, I think understand and then pay tribute to this plant by articulating, you know, how diverse but intelligently that we can, you know, then further share uh, the wisdom of this plant through. Uh, in truth, my ultimate dream would just simply be to enable Sue or, and all of the other clinical researchers to have unbelievable material mm -hmm. and to provision that 
and a broad cross-spectrum of chemovars. For those who haven't heard that term, that really is more accurate than, say, talking about cultivars, which is very plant-specific, looking from a production perspective. But a chemovar is a chemical variety, and this really is you know, a more true uh, established baseline than a strain name. Uh, it is the case that if you take for a, a terrible example, Blue Dream, and put that into four different growing environments, you will find uh, with very different environmental uh, conditions, completely different pharmacology being produced within the plant. And so it's been a passion working with patients to try to provision patients in a way that they could reproduce really exciting efficacy. I've seen really radical anecdotes like so many in our community here. And I've also seen the fallout of an anecdote that wasn't able to be sustained. We weren't able to continue to improve the quality of life of the patient we were working with as a result of a change in supply or a loss of that particular flower material. So I've really worked hard to both curate product in a way that makes it a little bit more approachable at this early stage of evidence-based medicine, trying to say that if we simply look at the chemovar and then also the narrative of the producer and the kind of love and depth of craft that's gone into that product, that that's going to go a long way towards meeting people's needs. And, uh, but I've tried to go much farther. So now I'm in this ridiculous overcompensation where I'm driving an incredibly overbuilt wild facility that I have three-dimensional mapping going on where there's these uh, high-density sensors at every three feet at many layers in the canopy telling a story about these relationships between genotype the actual like, plant's essence and this experience it's having in the environment. And those uh, exchanges are very complicated. There's chemical signaling, there's VOCs, there's barometric pressure, there's certainly vapor pressure deficit, temperature, humidity. Turns out white light wavelength and photobiology becomes one of the most important things in trying to figure out how do we harness chemovars in a consistent way. And one of the reasons why cannabis from Mendocino is so amazing has a lot to do with the solar radiation and this incredible intense light condition that just drives this really rich therapeutic cannabis. And you know, we're trying to reproduce those kinds of conditions in a lot of different variants and then resource that material to people that can benefit. Uh, the reality is we're at the beginning of a really long journey, but typically only companies at scale that are like big ag companies have access to this kind of technology. And I feel really blessed to be able to try to bridge those worlds as best I can with uh, an absolute like heart of service towards this whole plant perspective and this community that has been working for generations to lift the plant into prominence to serve an increasingly broad demographic. Mm -hmm. But also we are you know tangled with these forces that have a profit imperative that are you know maybe arguably practicing the worst aspects of capitalism and want to commodify at every uh, step this sort of ancient plant spirit that we're really trying to provision and resource. So uh, it's quite a ride. Uh, in any case, I'm really excited about the chemical varieties coming out of this community mm -hmm. and uh, a variety of other communities around the world. One last thing I'll say is that uh, there are varieties of cannabis that are becoming available to the public for the first time in history that, for example, are non-myrcene dominant, like a beta-myrcene compound that we see, the wild type of terpenoid development in cannabis. Uh, for the first time, we have a huge new array of product options that, for people who may have had negative experiences in the past, may very well experience a completely different, renewed relationship with products that have different pharmacology. We may be well able to serve women, people that are 50 and up, people that are underserved in the existing demographic of this kind of industry and the core consumer that's driving the consumption in that industry. And so I'm really excited about a world where we can be good for an increasing demographic through, in part, a product mix that encourages really broad expression and display of the full potential of the chemical varieties of cannabis. Awesome, you know, and kind of uh, getting a little deeper, I think, into, I think, terpenes in the conversation about terroir, you know, um, it's really interesting because there's this, uh, the appellations of origin, kind of uh, creating the, these protected terms around where plants are grown, you know, um, I think that's, that's a double-edged sword, you know, I, a lot, as, as a lot of these really, really robust kind of testing standards have been implemented through California, you know, um, for what it's worth at SC Labs, we've begun to, you know, from the trends and data across time of all the fails and how these compliance fails happen, you know, we can start to begin to predict uh, the Appalachian regions that uh, plants are grown in by the pesticide signature of the four to five, seven compounds that follow it, 
you know, to, you know, abate, which is kind of showing in so many ways, uh, you know, these areas around Agland, you know, right, like around almonds and Stanislaus and the avocados and Carpinteria and, you know, all through a lot of the Central Valley and Salinas. And I think this plays a really big part of the conversation, you know, as we start to understand hemp, you know, and industrial hemp and what does that mean? There's hemp for human consumption. There's also hemp for rope and fiber and stock, or I mean, and sales and stuff like that. But as far as human consumption and public health and safety, you know, we really start understanding um, more about the terroir where something's grown. It's like there's, that's a double-edged sword because terroir, you know, expressed when you plant cannabis in the soil, you know, in a pristine microbiome region that hasn't been devastated by herbicides, fungicides, and pesticides. You know, the, uh, one op, you know, a lot of work Elaine Ingham with Soil Food Web has done to show, you know, the way secondary metabolites pr uh, produced in plants can double when soil uh, biology is optimized for certain plants being grown, you know, but that's also, you know, not going to be then seen or expressed whenever something's grown in, you know, a really devastated ag land area where there's incredibly high pesticides, heavy metals in the soil, and that uh, terpene expression isn't going to be really played out. But, um, you know, I'd really love to open up kind of some of the, you know, thoughts kind of around some of these, um, you know, both, both the way that terpenes can be you know, really expressed and pulled out in higher amounts when grown optimally and organically and regeneratively. And then also kind of some of these, I guess, landmines that are in the supply chain and field around contaminants and pesticides, you know, especially when people are trying to get material to concentrate and make all these products out of. So, please. Um, I, I, on as far as, you know, what is available to do work with in a clinical setting, Sue, um, as far as I know, you are the only one that has done clinical trials, a whole flower uh, oh, trials? Or? We're, we're the only ones doing nonprofit drug development research on flower, trying to put flower on the market as a prescription medicine to force insurance companies to have to pay for it. But the point about the terpene diversity, there is none, right? In the federal government, yeah. flower we're forced, we'll never be able to understand the clinical effects of terpenes in these controlled trials because the, the diluted powder we get from the government is completely devoid of terpenes or any diverse cannabinoids, just CBD to THC ratio is all we get from them, so. It's, it's hard to, you know, to understand the clinical effects of all these terpenes when we're not even allowed to employ them in trials. Right. I, I think what's really excited, exciting about this particular point in time is that just now, because of the farm bill, we now have access to everything except yes, THC. Good point. So, you know, from, from a clinical research standpoint, the ability to do the exact same kind of study that you're doing yeah. with a phytochemically rich product that has a, a nice, diverse, and controllable set of both cannabinoids and terpenes mm -hmm. in a structural, you know, structured clinical trial setting. Um, you know, this is the first time in history, U.S. history, that this has been possible for us. You know, there are a number of other folks that are out there doing some clinical yeah, um, studies, um, but they have to get really sneaky about it. You have to import product from Canada, of all places, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. We have an, oh, all this beautiful cannabis right here, and we have to import it from Canada in order for it to be a legal study drug, mm -hmm. um, or otherwise using a combination of epidiolex um, and um, Marinol, yeah. uh, so a, a synthetic delta 9 THC mm. in combination with botanically derived CBD. So those are those are kind of the only ways that we have right now. But I I, I can tell that we're going to have a ton of you know hemp as an investigational new drug application, um, and then the ability to really quantify well what what is what's mediated by a broad spectrum product, aka hemp, versus a full spectrum product which includes THC. This is a really exciting time. Mm -hmm. And we're talking here about you know clinical trials for products that would move forward towards a prescription basis. I think another side of you know the the important. And uh, which, you know, the, the, the prescription available whole flower is imperative that we get to that point as well, that we go through those steps. But I think there's also this huge opportunity for the wellness or over-the-counter whole flower aspect and really understanding that um, as, a, as a consumer, as a patient, as a wellness patient, without going to the doctor, there's steps that you can take to track what you're using, what those you know, cannabinoids and terpenes that you are, and empower yourself as a consumer, as, as a patient, or other friends and family members to you know, really understand what 
what product are you using? What you know, is the cannabinoid ratio? What is the terpenes? And, and find those that you like. And it may not be always the same name of product that you find on the shelf, but really understanding what best suits you and empowering the individual. I know through history, you know, my cannabis history, it was what's in the bag that you got from your friend, and you know, you just, you know, not test results. And but now we have this availability with. Uh, labels and information and journals and other tools that can be used to track your own use and taking that on as a personalized you know, effort, I think, is, is very important as well. If I could say a bit more about a patient approach that we've evolved at Pharma that has been used for a lot of years. It's very simple, but I would love a practical takeaway. Uh, using often Jeremy's data from Cascadia as a baseline so that we have apples-to-apples -apples results of characterizing the pharmacology, then teaching people simply about how to use titration. For those who don't know about the titration process, measuring an increment, reproducing that increment, coming to know that in your own physiology, the relationship between this plant chemistry and yourself, which is going to be very distinct from others, and then building the dose until you hit undesirable side effects, backing it off, then you understand that minimum effective dose, or med, like what's the correct amount of a particular material for your needs? You know, it used to be, of course, how much can you withstand, now it is really, what do you need in terms of improving the quality of life, improving the quality of your flow states and creativity, improving the quality of being a human being with a relationship to consciousness and to being present at any given moment? To, but then after titration, getting into deliveries. The reality is I really love burning cannabis and I have a long-standing relationship <laughs> with pyrolysis, but I will suggest that you probably are not ever going to experience the full impact of a unique terpene composition mm -hmm. unless you are vaporizing that flower. If you're vaporizing it, you're going to have an unbelievably diverse palette of flavors and aromas that you simply cannot easily dis discern when you are burning that same material. And in fact, it's also an economical way to consume cannabis products because of the fact that most of the THC is combusting when you are burning it. And that that's, or not most, but it, you are in a 20 to 30 percent loss is something in a recent paper. In any case, if people understand that there's some pharmacology, they use titration, they work with delivery systems in an intelligent way, perhaps combinate, com combining tincture and flower and other whole plant derived products, and then deploy observation and record in a sort of clear way, the revolution is now. We don't necessarily need to wait for double blind peer reviewed clinical trials to vindicate the full therapy therapeutic power of this plant, but we do need to empower individuals with a process that's pretty concise and accessible so they can work with the flower that's being produced here to change their lives. Awesome. Yeah. 100%. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And with that being said, you know, I think uh, we, you know, it's, it's important for us, you know, in, in, in respect to this plant to be more articulate in the way we talk about the plant and sophisticated in the way we talk about terpenes. And, you know, really to understand terpenes is the number one metric to really help overall de understand, determine quality, how well something was, how well something was grown, how well it was, fre how fresh it is, how well it was dried and cured, you know, because from what we see in kind of testing, you know, from whenever plants fresh frozen to, you know, fully dried, you know, you, there's about 60, 70 plus percent terpene loss just from the drying process, even in perfect curing conditions. And so, you know, to really understand terpenes as this driving metric and quality, and then they become more, I think, versed in the, the flavor and uh, the, the range of terpenes that are shown, you know, because, you know, we use these words, indica and sativa, to try to articulate effect, but they're very limiting and they're not properly, you know, so now that we know better, I think as leaders and thought leaders in the community, the way we understand, I think more of the complexity of, you know, myrcene, beta carophylline, kind of relaxation, terpenaline, limonene, pinene, up, more uplifting, focusing, inspirational is, you know, the way forward that we can really help bridge the gap between the science and the medicine, to really pay tribute to, you know, because this could go a few different ways, single molecule, isolate, distillate, highest, you know, people would go to bar for, you know, shots of 180 proof, out, you know, Everclear. So it's like to really tease out, I think, some of these quality things and to pay tribute is one of the biggest uh, services that we can play, you know, in each one, teach one, because, you know, veterans, post-traumatic stress, you know, anybody new to cannabis is hypersensitive endocannabinoid system. And so, you know, they say dose slow and titrate slow. 
because uh, you know it's you, we could very easily share something with somebody that could set them away from ever using cannabis again, even though they might be destined for it. Yeah. But you know, with that being said, you know, I'd love to share it and open it up for any you know kind of closing comments as we begin to wrap up this panel. I, I just want to mention on the dosing, we've been able to persuade FDA to approve patient self-titration. Mm -hmm. That is a huge breakthrough for uh, the cannabis movement because until then, FDA was only about fixed dosing models and you had to have precision dosing anytime you propose clinical trials, but they're finally open to this after years of debate. And so that's gonna help uh, be able to uh, you know, allow us to demonstrate efficacy in clinical trials. Because before then they were forced to take 50 milligrams twice a day whether they needed it or not. So they get a boatload of side effects without being able to demonstrate any efficacy. Um, the other thing I just wanna uh, emphasize what AD was saying about the scientists sourcing cannabis from Canada for clinical trials, that's the only other option. And sadly, I'm our next clinical trial looking at um, late stage cancer patients, it's an FDA phase three trial where we're, we're looking at smoked cannabis flour for treating the breakthrough pain of cancer patients. And I'm going to buy flour from Canada and it just breaks my heart, especially meeting all these talented passionate farmers yesterday mm -hmm. and knowing all the assets that we have here and having to go buy this, what, what Canada, I mean, not to bag on Canada, but honestly, their flower is only one step above University of Mississippi, and it was the, uh, sorry, anybody, you I'm just saying, this. I just, we, we just tried to, we just tried to open up a drug master file with our FDA in the U.S., and it had the presence of three mycotoxins. It was blocked from oh. even allowing us to import it. So, and by the way, the Canadian company that shared, that provided this um, had to put out a press release to announce that their flower was contaminated, and, and you would think, oh my God, their stock is probably gonna plummet. It didn't have any effect on their stock because guess what? They don't even care about the quality of their flower. They seem to be only focused on the markets and how their stock price is, and I'm just saying that's why I'm here today because I'm so excited to be surrounded by people who actually care about quality medicine and caring for patients, so thank you guys. And with that, uh, we're closing on time. So thank you very much, guests. Thank you very much for uh, receiving us. Thank you. Bless you. Thank you, everybody.